So, welcome everyone to this uh, session on decentralized, uh, decentralized web and decentralized tools uh, for communities. Uh, we will try in these 50 minutes to introduce this very tough and full of uh, uh, asperities and funny stories uh, that is uh, the subject of uh, decentralized web uh, and uh, internet. Uh, and I will start just to try to get all the people who forgot who, to watch the first episodes of this story. So, previously on the internet, in five minutes. So, at first, the internet was created decentralized by militaries and hippies on LSD. Uh, they wanted uh, to be able to survive to uh, nuclear bomb wars and uh, government censorship. So they dreamed a network where no nodes could be uh, uh, shut down uh, so that no nodes that could be shut down will kill the whole network. So uh, that's all the internet uh, raised and uh, then uh, that was the first golden age of protocols where everything, uh, everyone uh, use, every computer can communicate between each other with uh, uh, TCP and DNS and other standards that became the, the, what uh, was the, the first uh, uh, infrastructure of the internet. And they will tell if I'm wrong after. And uh, so the, the internet was at that time really decentralized, but somehow in the 90s when the web arrived, people wanted, not like normal people wanted to use the internet too, because they discovered, wow, we put, can put documents on the internet. So suddenly they said, yeah, but maybe W3C documentation is not so readable for everyone. So some people, we call them startups, started to say, oh, we can help you, but yeah, it will cost you maybe some money and maybe your freedom. Well, let, let's see, mm -hmm. let's see. So then Google came and Facebook, and they offered great interfaces to use the internet and the web. But, but we see today the, the, the limits of this system, where uh, we see that all our data, even in France, even in Europe, are all in the US under, uh, the, the, uh, under the control of uh, more, more or less the NSA, uh, more or less uh, directly. Uh, we see that all our files are uh, uh, synced <coughs> on Dropbox and are all uh, 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 recreating uh, the, the centralized nodes we see that when Mega Upload dies, it's uh, tons of content that just go off offline in a minute. So, uh, more or less, uh, uh, since a long time, uh, people uh, stand to say we need to re decentralize the internet. And today will be the opportunity to show some of those uh, uh, attempts to bring back re decentralization. I suggest we start with a presentation of what was done during the Wisha Labs camp that just happened before the Wisha Fest, so that you can see uh, if Alex, Axel, Alex, Axel, Axel, Alex, Alex is ready. Uh, what, uh, what those crazy people have in mind to save us all. Hello, thank you. I'm, I've been told that this only goes forwards and not backwards, so I have to make sure I don't press it prematurely. Um, so I'm going to be introducing a little bit of the work that WeShare Labs, which if you don't know about it, is a sort of fringe event to WeShare Fest. Um, it's been happening over the last four days, basically. Um, and it's a sort of hackathon slash networking slash sort of meeting of minds event. And one of the things we worked on, and sort of one of the sort of micro outcomes, was looking at how we can conceive of and how we can develop decentralized social web and sort of open data formats, um, allow people to host their own data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm not a technical person, not a coder, so hopefully this will be understandable to everyone, um, even the technical people. So at the moment, as people have said, your data is stored by big servers, big companies. Um, and what we want to do, ideally, is put your profiles, individual people, information of organizations, events, locations, uh, as profiles listing your information, your resources offered, your resources requested, for example, this is putting it in the context of the sharing economy as an example. 
and store those on independent servers. So you can host them yourself on your home computer, or you can give it to a service provider that hosts it for you, or your local co-working space, um, or WeShare could actually host it for you, because you trust them, not just putting it with a big organization. And if you want, at any point, you can take it back. It's your data. It's just in the custody of someone. And the mic's died. Um, it's fine. Really? OK. Um, so here's an example. Um, here's, uh, here's an example sort of micro network of, this is WeShare Labs, maybe in the middle, WeShare Fest down in the left-hand corner, and we've got various nodes, people, organizations, events, places, and we can run a query on this, just like we would with a central database um, owned by an organization. So let's say we want to find people attending WeShare Labs, these people, but we're looking for something more specific, or we want to refine it. Uh, we can search for their friends as well. And who of those then live in Paris? But maybe I'm looking to couch surf. So who of those, um, who of those have couches to offer? We can find two people. And to do that, we're not just querying one server, one database held by one organization. We're hosting, uh, we're querying nearly 20 servers and a whole bunch more profiles. Um, individuals holding their own, organizations holding them four people, even individuals holding organizations ones. <coughs> Or another query, um, we could look at WeShare Paris, who's a member of WeShare Paris? Who speaks Korean and English because we need to do a translation? Can't find anyone. We can expand the search, look at affiliate organizations and their friends, and now we can find someone. And again, we're querying a whole bunch of different servers and a whole bunch of different people's information. And from the other perspective, if you're putting information on this service, you can decide who accesses it and under what conditions. So, for example, this person could say, well, I offer translation services at 15 euros an hour. But under certain conditions, I offer them for free, because I want to help the open source or the collaborative economy movement, or I want to help charities. So in this instance, this person says, well, they're available for free if you're coming to WeShareFest, um, and to my friends in the local area. Um, so if you just go on, unauthenticated, you're just a person browsing the web, you can see the option to engage as just a member of the world, but you can also see that under certain conditions, you can get a different arrangement. And if you then authenticate yourself uh, with a web ID, um, this person, their server where their information is hosted, can check, can verify you, and then you can access, access the service or access the resource differently. And so this is showing all the possible servers in this setup, um, all the possible profiles. So thank you, that was a little bit messy, but um, there you go. If you want to find out more or get involved in WeShare uh, Labs, this is the website. Um, there's probably going to be another one in October, if not before. Um, there's also a few of us around, like Ali and Daniel, who helped organize this last one. So all find me, and we'll, uh, we'll let you know a bit more. But there's loads of information on there about what, what people have been up to. Thank you very much. Um, So the good news is that you can also meet those uh, We Shall Labs folks just after uh, today at 6.30. We are meeting at the We Shall Village to have a, 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 a debriefing of what happened during those four days. Maxime, and to we, see we Shall Village Tent. We Shall Village Tent. Thank you. And so, yeah, that's somewhere there with nice big pillows. And, and that's all for We Shall Labs. So now, start with Edward. If you want to say a uh, small on, you can, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Hello, yeah, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. So I'm one of the co-founders of Stample. Um, Stample is a knowledge network. Um, so we're interested in two things. One is the um, co-creation of knowledge, and the other one is uh, decentralized social networks. Um, the question behind. Uh, these two things is the same. It's the idea of trust and the idea of information asymmetry. Uh, if you look back, there's a, a story of an economist in the 60s called Akarov who wrote a paper on information asymmetry in, in the market for old cars. And everyone uh, thought he was quite ridiculous. In fact, there's four papers that refused this paper uh, from uh, journals. But 20 years later, 40 years later, he got uh, the Nobel Prize for his, for his work. Um, information asymmetry is kind of gone in the realm of uh, retail and stuff like that because now when you buy an old car you can go on the internet check out the prices check out how much it's really worth and you know decide if you're gonna buy it or not but it 
appeared somewhere else. It appeared on social networks. So you spent all of your time putting data about who you are on the internet, and you're not getting most of it back. I mean, how many things do you like on Facebook? How many uh, journals, uh, articles, magazines, uh, books, uh, movies, all of these things, these places that you like, all of this stuff is things that you say about yourself. It's a great amount of knowledge and value, and it's not given back to you in any way. And that's an information asymmetry problem. So I don't want to go too far into this, um, but talking about decentralization, as far as I'm concerned, there's really um, two central ideas, and um, it's a big and open question. People have been working on it for 15 years. Um, it's quite a technical challenge in some ways. I would say there's two fundamental things. One is the idea of uh, having an Excel for the internet. And that's basically the linked data road or the semantic web. So all of the, the, the idea is that all the data in the world would be published in a format that's universal. And so as long as you have access to it, then you can choose how you're going to represent that information. And that potentially holds limitless possibilities. And if you think of the power of Excel and how it's used in practically every single company in the world, um, having the same uh, potential with the internet is huge. So that's one of the, uh, the core potential of, of decentralizing uh, social networks. The other idea is um, this notion of uh, retribution, you know, the allocation of resources. And when we're talking about the, um, the collaborative economy, um, retribution is very important. Everyone is contributing, but is everyone getting paid? And so the, the second road to decentralization is this notion of uh, transaction-based decentralization. And you see that with all of the Bitcoin or like the future of Bitcoin-based um, protocols like Ethereum, stuff like that, where the idea is whenever you provide a service to the, the, the decentralized network, if you provide space, for example, and people use it, you get paid. There's a small transaction for everything that happens in the, in the network. And that's um, also in very early stage, much earlier stage, in fact, than, than the linked data um, world. But it's very interesting, and, and it's embodied uh, for the largest part in the ideas of people like Jeremy Rifkin or uh, Jaron Lanier, who have been talking about this idea that it's great um, to have this collaborative economy, but at this point, mostly it's just people giving away stuff and not really getting it back. So, um, to me, that's the core ideas, and I'll, I'll uh, pass the microphone, and maybe we can get back to these questions after. So now, Ari, if you want to tell okay. us more on your work at the W3C yes. protocols. Okay, so, so the, the W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium. It's a standards body. It's responsible for things that some people here may use or have heard of, HTML5, XML, all of these protocols. The protocol is just a language for machines. So you know, if you have three people that speak Francais, three people that speak Chinese, and they can't communicate, we have a problem. It's the exact same issue with machines. So we try to define the, standard, the standards that let all the machines in the world talk what we hope is a single universal information space, which is the web. And we've always been a bit, um, worried about how centralized the web is becoming. In particular, um, social networking, this is our most you know, intimate social personal data, is effectively um, you know, becoming more and more locked up in silos. And this hampers everyone from innovators who want to be able to have access to social information. It pre pre presents actual political problems insofar as that, you know, who really has all of your information? Well, you know, the NSA, for example. And that you, as a, as a user, as a human, don't have any ability to get your data back, to control your data, to have any sort of autonomy of your data. This restricts the freedom of what you're, you can and cannot do. Um, thus, the problem has been that we have not historically had standards. So we have standards uh, for how to ship bits around, that's TCP, IP. And we have standards for how web pages can talk to each other, HTTP, HTML. But what we haven't had is we haven't had social standards. So the problem with decentralized social networks up till now has almost always been that when someone creates a decentralized social network, you go there, you're, oh yeah, it's great, it'll be wonderful. And it's an empty house. There's no one there, maybe three or four hackers talking to each other. And then what's even worse is that when you have multiple decentralized social networks, 
they can't talk to each other either. So you have this massive uh, Tower of Babel style of confusion going on. And we kind of think um, a standard would help, but we don't dictate the standards. We build them through consensus involving hackers, innovators, startups, large companies. Um, and we do this through a process called working groups. I'm just going to do a brief announcement and then uh, hand the mic over. And effectively, um, after years of waiting to get critical mass to really um, look into decentralizing the social web, it's far, it seems to be a, a very strange combination of a, a, a burst of enthusiasm from hackers and startups combined with the actual use of decentralized Twitter-like systems in large corporations, uh, IBM, SAP, have got the W3C to the point where we feel like we can pr produce a royalty-free open standard for the, not the entire social web, but a bottom-up uh, consensus over some of the basic parts like messaging, decentralizing the messaging, bringing the messages back together, message formats, and how to embed those messages into web pages. So that's going to be called the Social Web Working Group. It's going to start in uh, about a year. If you're a very technical person, get in touch with me and we'll talk about how you can join. And there's also going to be a sort of open forum for people who may not be super technical but would like their website to be part of a more decentralized social web. And that's going to be what's called the Social Interest Group. So just, uh, it is also currently running what's called the Federated Social Web Community Group, which if you use your favorite search engine, DuckDuckGo, Google, whatever, and you fat track that down, you can just hit a big red join button and jump on board. So, thank you. And now, Frank from Cozy Clouds. Hello, uh, so I'm Frank, CTO of Cozy Cloud. So basically what we do at Cozy is uh, that we make web applications smarter, uh, smarter and more respectful. How we do that? Simply by putting web applications and personal data on your hardware that people have at their home or that they rent uh, in a hosting provider, to a hosting co pro provider company. And this way, we bring three new things. The first one is that for people, they, they are empowered. The internet users take, take back the ownership of their data. The second one is that for developers, it's a way for them to build, to imagine new services because once you have all your data on this little box, you can imagine tons of new services like Edward described before. And then for big companies, it's an opportunity to compete against major cloud companies. And it's also an opportunity to, uh, to have a better relationship with their customers. So I'm going to, to get a little bit deeper in these three points. The first one it, uh, look, looks uh, obvious if you, uh, if you are following the actuality. You can see you recently with the PRISM, uh, with the Prism problem, uh, we, uh, we discovered that uh, we are to, all uh, spied by, uh, by secret agencies. So the idea of getting back his data all, and in some way what, uh, what we own, uh, like, uh, like when you put your emails uh, in, the, in the Gmail box, uh, you lose the, the control on it, you, you cannot really export it, you cannot manage it the way you want, you have to follow the rules of, of, uh, Gmail, of Google. So the, once you will have it on your box, you will be able to, uh, to do what you want with it. And for developers, but because most of us are, are not technical, we made a platform. So on that platform, anyone can build his own app, and for developers, uh, uh, so it could be a, an individual software engineer, it could be a, a big company, it could be a startup, who can build application where you reuse all your data. Your data could be, uh, of course, your mails, your tax, your tasks, your notes, but data that comes from your contacts that talk about you, uh, that comes from all these devices. Today we only have uh, our smartphone who, who build, uh, who, who record stuff, stuff about us, but now more and more we have this kind of device who uh, can who record the number of steps you do. Does anyone in the, in the room uh, use a... Uh... It's a photometer. Okay. It's, uh, it's, for, it's a fitness uh, object that, that records every step, uh, the number of steps you do and how much time do you, you sleep. 
and there are tons of uh, connected objects like that, like uh, a scale, uh, like uh, a blood pressure monitor. And, and so uh, once you have all this data, you can imagine tons of new, of new services like predictions, uh, you can uh, imagine health services, you can imagine uh, productivity services. So it's a, it will be a, a super opportunity for developers to develop new, new things. And for big companies, why it's important? Because today, they are, uh, the, the, the major cloud companies are, uh, are, are going a little bit further. They say, OK, we have, uh, now we, are, we, make, we made web apps. But now we can compete with other companies. Say, okay, if we do like you, we will uh, we will offer to your customers the same service plus all the all service you can imagine around uh, around personal data. And they want and because uh, and because of that, big, big companies are afraid and they want to find a, a, an alternative to uh, to it uh, and decentralization. Will bring them the opportunity to uh, to develop uh, small small applications on this stuff, or to, or simply distributing it. We 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 built uh, that uh, that box with a partner, which is a big company, and th that will bring them a new opportunity to provide new services. Uh, if you. Uh, if you have questions, we'll uh, so everybody uh, presents uh, basically the project, and then we will have questions later. Uh, and now we will have the last person to present, uh, Primavera, who will not talk about decentralized. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, decentralized uh, uh, a web of documents, but decentralizing even the network itself. So. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so the problem is that, in fact, the internet has grown to be more and more centralized on the application layer. But, in fact, if we look at the infrastructure of the internet, it is also centralized at the infrastructure level. So, um, this can create problems in terms of, for instance, surveillance. So, everything, all the communication we have, have to go through the ISP, which can monitor and um, identify what we are trying to say. Uh, there is also the problem of censorship and filtering. So basically, uh, AISP needs by law to censor certain type of content. We have an uh, extreme situation, for instance, in China. And so um, if we connect to an ISP, we are not actually sure that we can connect to every service that we want. And then there is also the problem that um, the ISP essentially represents this kind of single point of failure in the sense that if the ISP goes down, every user that is connected to this particular ISP then does not have access to the internet anymore. And so, uh, mesh networking basically is bringing the concept of decentralization at the level of the infrastructure. And the idea is that we are not connecting directly to one ISP, but it's, um, we create basically a peer-to-peer -peer network where every single user that is connected to the network Act, uh, act both as a relay node, so it's transferring the, it's routing the packets through the network, and as an access point. And so the idea is we don't have any single point of failure, but we have this kind of distributed uh, network of peers that all provide connectivity. They all contribute with their own resources to the network. Now the problem is that um, this, of course, requires some. Uh, high technical uh, knowledge as opposed to just connecting to a one ISP and then the ISP is taking care of all the routing and etc. Every single uh, user that wants to be part of the mesh network needs to, uh, it needs to install a software and needs to configure it and etc. So up until now, uh, the mesh networking has pretty much been deployed essentially by like tech savvy people that exactly know what they're doing and the people that are actually connecting to those mesh network are not really contributing to the network but are just passive users. And so the question is we need to create incentives or we need to at least make it easier for people that want to contribute to the mesh network to actually uh, contribute with their own resources. And so the, the nice thing about the, this problem is that in fact we only need a few people to deploy certain application that makes it user friendly, that makes it easy for anyone to actually contribute in order to promote the mesh network. So we have, um, for instance, Commotion, which has, it's a project that deployed a specific toolkit 
which incorporate all the applications that, need, that are necessary in order to deploy the mesh network. And so anyone could install this application on various devices and then just configure it slightly and then it can actually contribute to the mesh network. And then slowly there is actually people that started to develop uh, hardware device. So little boxes like this which are pre-installed with commercial or with other uh, mesh networking software and which are pre-configured as well, and so it, it just suffices to buy this piece of, so, of hardware and just install it like on the roof or as an antenna or just like bring it along, and then those, um, those actually become automatic um, applications that will run the mesh network for you. And so more and more we are actually, um, the, the, the difficulty to implement the mesh network is, is becoming lower and lower, uh, more recently, with the file chat application, for instance, which actually use the Bluetooth uh, functionalities of the iOS, so that anyone that actually install file chat on their iPhone can actually contribute and create actually a network, a mesh network on the fly, and communicate with anyone that is around, which will also contribute to relaying the the packets. And so this actually brings to this uh, new level in which anyone that actually have already pre-existing device could actually, by just installing one simple application, could actually contribute to creating a mesh network. Now, uh, so what are the, the motivation to actually want and create a mesh network? So the first one is that it's much cheaper. So we don't need to create all those infrastructure, uh, in, in, for instance, in, in places where there is no connectivity, like Africa, whatever. So there is, for instance, the mesh potato project, which is deploying various mesh networks in Africa in order to provide connectivity to areas which are not served by the, by the standard LSP. Uh, there is also the, um, the advantage that there is no, point, no single point of failure, so it becomes much harder to destroy the network because the network is able to reconfigure itself automatically and it's dynamically refining the right path in order to actually transfer the packet. And then finally, which I think is the most important, is the concept of autonomy. So the idea is, uh, instead of being dependent on one ISP or any third party that is actually providing internet access to us, and we don't really know what's going on, we don't know if there are any restrictions, we don't know if they are actually monitoring all the information, etc., then we can create our own network, we can actually um, empower ourselves because we actually understand how it works, we actually know that it is possible to uh, do it yourself internet, and um, we are in control of, what's, of, of what is going on in those networks. Um, now, to just to finish, yeah. So the the really interesting thing of this is uh, one, it is actually it has the potential of actually presenting a counterpower to the standard centralized system as long as there is in fact enough uh, easy to use um, software. The problem is that the mesh network always needs this uh, interface with the actual global internet, and that's where the problem comes in. In the sense that you can have the most decentralized network. Uh, everything set up and do it by yourself, but if you actually want to connect to the internet, you do need to connect to the backbone of the internet, and therefore you need to have this interconnection with another network, which is a ISP or a transit operator. And so the question becomes, even if I, have, I am respecting net neutrality, I am not censoring anything, or I'm not monitoring my communication within the mesh network, what happens when I actually transit to an actually commercial operator, which is in fact not respecting the same principle? And the other problem which uh, I, ho I hope to open the discussion to this is then um, if we actually manage to, if mesh network manage to actually get so widespread that maybe you can actually connect one mesh network to another in order to actually create a, a overall global network as well, um, then perhaps we don't have the problem of like relying on those third party ISP, but then the question becomes how can we create, uh, how can we deploy decentralized application which will run on the mesh network at the same time as they will run when we're connected to the global internet. Um, the issue being, how do we actually communicate to each other? How do I know that all, if we create a mesh network now, for instance, how do I know how do I get to communicate with that person there if I cannot connect to a central server such as Twitter or Facebook? And how can we create an application that is so decentralized that will actually work at the same time internally within the local mesh network and externally, and at the same time when we connect to the global internet. Okay. 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 So, you see that uh, at the exception of mesh networks, that uh, seems to be 
uh, in the, at the middle of technical uh, nightmares or technical challenges at least. Uh, it seems that uh, decentralized technologies and decentralized thinking is around for a long time now. And it seems uh, the provocative question would be why it doesn't happen. Why everybody is talking about decentralization, but why uh, it's still, we are still all on Facebook and all on Google, and why we are not all owning our data already. Uh, this, could, this is uh, mostly a problem of commodity because today you can uh, super easily uh, connect on Google or Facebook and subscribe and if you have to uh, host your own, uh, own application on your hardware it's quite hard so it's, it's, I think it's mainly because of that and plus the marketing that you now Google and Facebook are, are famous so it really, it really helps uh, this but what we think is that now we are, uh, we are at an interesting point of the, of the web development because now technologies are really better for anyone, allows anyone to host his uh, web application, his web services. Uh, the, the wire, the, the bandwidth is uh, really higher, so it's not, uh, it's not crazy to think that anyone can uh, host his own uh, web services. So, we think that decentralization won't be a longer a thing uh, of thinker. So you, you, on the, the fact that the, the products, the, the, the hardware will go lower, will make decentralized happen alone, or there is something missing? I, 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 I'm talking maybe about the propaganda discussion. With I, I will make it short to let uh, others talk. Uh, I, I think we've to make it very short, we focus so when we try to say uh, how good uh, the decentralized, decentralized services are, we focus too much on the privacy aspect. Uh, it requires a lot of attention to understand why it's, it matters, why it's important. But the distributed services brings a lot more values. Uh, they are more efficient. They, you can communicate quicker. You can uh, you can cross different uh, different data from different services and th and this we, we should focus more on what on uh, on the other uh, added on the other aspect uh, on the other things that are brought by by uh, distributed systems than focusing too much on privacy um, so 10 years ago I was a student at the University of Toronto and I was doing environmental studies and I kept hearing people in my classes thinking that they would sell clothes that are ecologically friendly because they're ecologically friendly. And that just doesn't happen. I mean, that's not what people go for. They buy clothes because, you know, they make them look good or because other people have them or whatever the reasons are. There's this notion of desire. Um, I think that's at the core of what the problem is with decentralized networks. Another example that I really like is the one with uh, Tesla, um, you know, the, the car company. Um, these guys make electric cars and people buy them like crazy, but they don't buy them because they're electric cars. They buy them because of a whole big beautiful story that they, they've put together around these cars, you know? I mean, they're the most advanced cars in the world and, you know, you put your hand near the, near the door and the handle just comes out, you know? And all this stuff, all this little magic is what people go for. And um, I think that's really what the, the, the key thing here is, is what's the use case? What's this incredibly innovative thing that, that you're going to be able to do with decentralized networks? This thing that's so interesting and, and empowering for people that they're actually going to go for it. Um, I mean, that's what we really, really focus on. It's, it's kind of like, you know, we do this and this and this and that's fantastic. Oh, and by the way, you know, you can get your data back or you can store it yourself. And that's great. And I think when we get to the point that the usage is there, and, and the technology is ready, and I mean, that's obviously one of the key components is, is, is bringing that technology together. And until you get to the point where there's the use case, the technology moves really slow. When you have the use case, then things can start going like crazy. I mean, we were just talking about earlier um, about HTML5. People have been using it for three years. The spec is not even finished. And, and that's the point. When people start taking control, taking you know, that technology and, and building things with it that are truly useful, then things happen. I think we're 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 getting we're getting to that place, but uh, it's taking some time. I'll make I'll make a, a few points. So so, first thing is, um, you know, why has so decentralization, you know, has always been innovation, right? So the internet 
the initial TCP IP, you know, packet switching networks were a massive decentralized alternative to the big telco operators at the time. And they have proven to be very successful. So it's not like decentralization is always impossible. Same point, it's very hard, right? So in general, the reason why people use centralized systems, uh, there's two or three, I can mention them very quickly. Often, you know, why do you search via Google and not via uh, Wikia or a decentralized search engine? So I used to work for a search engine. Search engines are hard, right? It's very hard to decentralize the amount of computation that's required to do searches quite efficiently. Um, you know, in general, when you decentralize, you also, to be honest, open yourself, you have control of your own data, but the security and privacy aspects are actually quite tricky to get right. So I have a friend that you know, works at Google, and he says, why do people should, of course they should trust us. We have a massive security team. We can take care of your personal data better than you can or some random startup. That is often kind of true. However, what I would say, and I, I totally agree, like we need to find the magic use cases. I can imagine, you know, activists, if you talked about decentralized social networks in Egypt, they really get it quite quickly. No problems. At the same point, um, we haven't really built the really user-facing thing that has mass adoption. But why I think it's interesting to be here is because I think all of these technical problems around latency and security and privacy, they're all solvable. We just need more people working on them, more technical people working on them. I think that the hard thing that we have to understand is what is the real problem that we're trying to solve. And one of the issues uh, could be that there are certain things that we could do with our massive collective intelligence that we enable over social networks. Um, you know, we could use our social networks to help you know, solve problems like global climate change. We use our social networks to have you know, political transformation. We can use our social networks to build up alternative communities. And these are not the sort of things that Twitter and Facebook are designed to do. But they are the sort of things that many of the people here are trying to do. And so if you're trying to build a world in which you, know, you're, you are not actually under constant surveillance, if we want the, in the web of our children to be a mass surveillance machine, then fine, you know, keep using Facebook and Google. But I do think there's a real ethical responsibility that the engineers who build the web feel, and I think a lot of people who are trying to build the collaborative economy feel that we should create an alternative. At the same point, I still haven't seen the one thing where I'm certain it will work that involves decentralized social networking. And mesh networking is included, unfortunately. So I would like to know what the audience thinks about what we can try to build or what ideas could be cool around decentralized uh, networking. Okay. Yeah, just to add one last thing. I think it's also uh, an important problem that we really should try and resolve is the fact that I think as a society, we are probably maybe not ready yet. In the sense that if we take at the example of uh, Bitcoin, for instance, which is like a completely decentralized, or designed as a completely decentralized system, which has pretty much proved to work pretty okay. But then, so it, this, this system actually would allow theoretically anyone to be their own bank and to like deal with their own financial transaction by themselves. The problem is that if we look at the way in which it, at, is at, it actually has evolved, then we can see that actually people, the, like most of the people I know that actually use Bitcoin, they don't even want to install their own wallet on their own laptop or on their own phone, they would rather rely on like a cloud wallet and they would rather rely on intermediaries and exchange and etc. And so in some way it's like even though the tool is actually there and the tool could potentially develop into a completely decentralized uh, payment, society as a whole seems to rather um, use and create a layer of centralization on top of this in order to like, I don't know if it's like comfort or what, but maybe because it's the fear of not being able to be your own bank. <coughs> Um, maybe it's because it's like just more convenient to always be able to connect to the cloud and not having to bring your uh, wallet on you. And so, or maybe it's human nature. Or maybe it's human nature that really wants an intermediary, I don't know. But so, the, the problem is I think it's, it's also really at the maybe pedagogical level or like just social level is like we are so used of relying on centralized institutions that even when we have a tool that is decentralized, we're recreating a centralized institution on top of it and we will rather use that institution. And so maybe it's because the tool is not good enough and therefore we actually need intermediaries because we don't trust the tool itself. Or maybe it's just because the people really just like are so used of it and we have to kind of like 
go through a process of learning that we actually can do things by ourselves and that decentralization can work just as well. And um, I will have just a question before uh, giving the mic to the, the, the audience. Could that be that decentralization just in utopia and that just like direct democracy, full bottom-up is not possible and that we need centers? Someone want to take this one? Uh, uh, of course, we at some point we, we, we like to have centers, but uh, we, we like to, to be able to choose them. Uh, in a democracy, you can vote, you can say, okay, uh, I prefer this guy, uh, and this, there is a consensus between people to say uh, how we elect this guy. But today with uh, cloud companies, you don't really have choice, there are not so much alternatives. And when you subscribe to one services, it's hard to, uh, to leave, and if you leave, uh, most of the time you lose, you lose all your data, or it's very complicated to reuse it in uh, other place. So if you can move your data from a provider to another one to make a kind of competition between them, you will be uh, in a better position to trust them because you can leave, you say, okay, uh, I, you, you did bad, so in the press uh, I learned that you did something wrong, so I, I can, uh, so I leave and I put my, uh, my services or my data in another place, or if I'm, uh, if I'm brave enough, I put it in, in my home. That's a, so it will maybe it will be a kind of a, a kind of middle between a full decentralization and a, and a full centralization. We have questions from the audience. Yeah, I, I find it interesting to see how the discussion moves away from technical solutions to actually asking about how are we as a society or as multiple communities going to interact with each other in different social aspects. So there is actually no claim um, that hierarchy is, uh, is a part of the human nature, I would say, because we know of the, the new civilization 7,000 years ago that was actually already aware of division of labor, several kinds of handicrafts, and they didn't have a state system, but they had one powerful tool that is called the script. So what we see here is that with the distribution of information or knowledge, if we might even claim that, um, we see that the way how we can interact is much more liquid and much more diverse than the implementations of hierarchical social organizations that started in Babylon and in Egypt so forth which misused script as a power of source, uh, as a source of power, of just having elite knowledge yeah, sourced in one place that now, as we're opening up, uh, yeah, i just pass it to you. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> what was the question, actually? Keep going. No, it's, it's just that um, I would totally subscribe to the idea that we're just so used to a hierarchical social organization that we cannot even imagine uh, with our languages that we use <coughs> the logic that is inside our languages that we cannot even produce any uh, non-hierarchical systems anymore and that we are now by, by cutting up the logics of all these decentralized networks we find claims and ideas how to reinvent, how to flatten the sphere again, but yeah, I ask you how well, I have to a quick it. question for you, a quick question, which is, I'm sort of, you know, due to the sharing economy thing, at W3C, we, we're used to more, how should you say, heavily corporate environments, um, and hacker environments, the sort of sharing economy thing is kind of interesting because it's in between. Do you think that there is a, a shift going on among like a generational shift where maybe people who are brought up on the internet are somehow more used to non-hierarchical thinking and global social networking or not? Or do you think, I mean, I'm not sure. I was often hoping that was the case, but I have trouble judging. I would answer this, that question differently. I would say I'm just, just not used to the user interface of uh, administration today. When I get my tax form, I just don't know what to do because there are no buttons, that's it. So it's the user interface, it's the way how administration makes an interact with it that makes it so disgusting. 
Yeah, I just, I just want to respond for a second. I think you've made a very, very good point. Um, whether or not, you know, we are so historically sort of stuck in, in hierarchical systems um, that we can move out of them, I think that's really the core challenge that we have today. Um, and so there's, there's a couple of points about that. Um, the first one, most of you probably know that, but I, I think that's kind of an incredible um, weak signal, the fact that the, the German law is now on, on GitHub. Um, you know, this is a big deal, you know, if we start getting the law to be version controlled and we can account for all the changes and so on and so forth, I think there's great momentum around the idea that we can move from what I would say is a notion of state to a notion of flow. Um, it's very strange, but it's very important. The world is changing too fast today to work the way it used to work. Um, it was okay to have hierarchical systems and it was okay to have states when things were changing slow. You know, because you could make a decision and it would it'd still be relevant a week later or two weeks later or two months or two years or maybe ten years. Um, you can't do that today anytime you make a decision um, and say things are going to be like this. The minute your sentence is over, things have changed. So that's the challenge of our time, is how do we deal with the fact that the world is changing extraordinarily fast, and how do we put together um, the, the technology and, and the structure that can handle that. And the example of GitHub is very powerful. And um, I just you know, um, remember that um, talk by Clay Shirky when he says that you know, one day internet is going to disrupt the democracy major, and I think we might just be there. I mean, it's only the starting point, but it's very encouraging. And, Yes. Um, uh, you were you were on a little bit earlier. You were talking about uh, that the, the distributed tools me, were, were missing a use case. But to me, there is a huge, huge uh, use case, uh, and it's Bitcoin. I mean, the Bitcoin community. Uh, I'm not talking about the currency, but the community is using a decentralized uh, technology. And uh, so don't we have here a, a real use case uh, where uh, all the, the knowledge about the distribution tools and distributed tools can uh, foster and can grow and can... Um... So, just an open question. I mean, I'll mention something about Bitcoin real quick. So, so I mean, Bitcoin is, a, is a, a wonderful example of a community there are actually many, many um, other communities that do alternative currencies, uh, you know, Dogecoin, all these weird coins. Um, at the same point, whenever I look at Bitcoin, I have to admit I'm somewhat like underwhelmed. And the reason I'm underwhelmed is because the main use I see of it, uh, which is fine, you know, I mean, it's useful to do, is to uh, you know avoid, you know, essentially you want to avoid paying taxes. And you would like to avoid currency controls when you're shifting money from out to out of China, which was a big use case up until recently, or out of Argentina, which I think people still do. And um, and also the way that Bitcoin works is you have a totally decentralized system. And how do people trust each other? Well, they, they document every single action they do. So this is big ledger, effectively. And they also uh, can contribute by just burning CPU cycles. Right? And that's kind of like... CPU cycles, the gold, that kind of reminds me of like alchemy or something. It's a bit weird. I would like to see things like Bitcoin that are more socially grounded in, in real world uh, communities and values, which aren't just uh, playing with the financial system and trying to create new kinds of finances. Because the, the main users of Bitcoin in the future will probably be hedge funds. Um, the question, and I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of the financial system in its current state. What all the alternatives kinds of currencies that we can do, and the modifications that we could do, that don't that rely on some of the archi architecture of things like Bitcoin, but don't rely on the actual current existing protocol, which I think has some issues. Um, yeah, so I think also Bitcoin is a really interesting example because it kind of goes back to the use case scenario, which is if we look at like popular and widely mainstream adopted, well, I guess Bitcoin is not really mainstream yet, but it, it, it kind of like is widely adopted. And so I guess the first one must, must have been like file sharing, which was obviously providing something in addition to just being decentralized. It was allowing people to actually get stuff that they wouldn't get otherwise. 
And then Bitcoin is somehow the same thing. Like I wonder if people, like probably the first pioneer actually wanted to Bitcoin because they love the ideology of decentralization, but what actually made it go mainstream is really just this added value that it was basically not paying taxes and making a lot of money out of speculation. And so it seems to me that for those two, the two examples at least, the, the decentralization was kind of secondary to the added value, that, and that's the use case. The use case is this added value. Now, what I think is absolutely extremely interesting about Bitcoin is that it also has uh, uh, sparked this new idea of uh, being able to... So I think um, if we look at the history of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, applications that have been deployed, we had at the beginning it was like the distribution of content and etc. so with uh, file sharing. And then we had like communication, anonymous communication like Tor or Freenet or whatever. And then we have mesh networking, which is actually the infrastructure of communication itself. And I think what uh, Bitcoin has shown, and I'm not sure if it's actually going to be the case, but it has shown that it is actually possible to disintermediate also at the level of the institution. And so I think Bitcoin has shown that we don't need a financial institution, which is something pretty amazing, because that was really, the, like the institution is by definition centralized, because the whole concept of institution is. And so if Bitcoin has shown, so if Bitcoin has shown that it is possible to have a decentralized financial institution or financial system, then maybe it is possible by using the same technology to actually replicate the, the model to different kind of institution, perhaps the state or whatever. So Ethereum is actually a really interesting example, which is kind of presenting itself as a potential decentralized alternative to the legal system as a whole. Now, is it actually going to work? I don't know. I mean, it's really ugly, but it is really interesting to see that um, this decentralized technology of the blockchain basically show that it is possible to have trust or trustless system, but that doesn't require the trust and coordination without having a centralized institution. This, I think, is absolutely fantastic, and I really hope. But then if you look at the applications so far, which have been deployed based on the blockchain, so we have Twister, which I don't think is used by anyone, and then we have BitMessage or Namecoin, which are like, they exist conceptually, but they have not been adopted, and I think it's because they are not providing anything else but being decentralized. And so I think if we really want to... Um, to get this technology going, and perhaps Ethereum is actually going to provide this added value because it is actually like providing things that wouldn't be available with another uh, platform. And so I think the decentralization is really about figuring out what is that decentralization allows that a centralized service cannot allow, and that's the use case that is going to make it mainstream. For Twister, it's also that it tried to burn my computer when I installed it. <laughs> we, we have a question. Yes, uh, I'm a, I'm a Eric, and I'm a, I have a legal background, so I, st I studied at a legal uh, school, and uh, I, I, I think I, I agree that uh, we should that it's good to go for a decentralized uh, network, um, any network. But, uh, but I wonder if. How are you then going to make uh, decisions in a uh, group and uh, decentralized uh, decision making? Or how do you... Is, is everybody ready for... Uh, able to understand uh, this way of thinking and operating? Because you are all looking to me like uh, very educated people. Eh? Uh, but I, 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 do you have uh, any ideas on, on that? Uh, I'll, do, I'll do it quickly, which yeah. is I think, you know, th there's kind of two like theories of human nature here. And of course all theories of human nature are, are kind of nonsense, but we can just entertain them. Um, one of which is that people are lazy and don't want to make decisions and want to delegate them up as much as possible to someone else. Um, and that's particularly when people are in situations when they're, you know, alone or afraid or don't feel like they know enough. Another theory is that, you know, if given the chance, people do want to have um, autonomy, and they would want to relearn the knowledge and skills that have otherwise they don't have. And so if you look at it, um, you know, today, I mean, I, just to mention, um, I think it's useful to actually mention the Occupy movement. So I visited one in Oakland, which was very interesting, where, you know, you had a lot of people who, to be honest, it was a weird mix of, of college graduates who couldn't find jobs and people who have been homeless for most of their lives. And strangely enough, I've never seen this before, those two groups of people were able 
to make decisions together. I mean, it was a bit tricky at times, but face to face and more or less democratically using some kind of hand signals and sort of cons consensus decision making methods. I was rather shocked. What actually the problem that happened, and which is I think where tools are kind of necessary, if you assume that people can make decisions together in groups, which I think they can, and is how can that those group decisions scale? Because it's very easy to make a group decision in a group where there's like three friends. But when, let's say, Occupy tried to do voting over Twitter, it became complete nonsense very quickly. And it was very hard to keep track of what people were voting on, what they were doing, and who was deciding what. And then, of course, small hierarchies sort of took over. So I think that, that the, the cultural uh, mechanisms to deal with that and the tools haven't been developed yet. And I would say once those are developed, then we can probably build a world where people actually can make decisions and let's hope they want to. I would like to add something. Uh, you, in fact, you, when you see decentralization, you, it looks like you, you think it's very different from actual services. For most people, when they use Facebook uh, or Twitter, they are already using a decentralized service. They are thinking, they are talking directly to their contacts, and so, so moving to a decentralized one it won't change so much for them. Facebook and Twitter basically are simplification of Internet, and so when they will move to something that will do more and the same thing with more uh, more services, it's, it's, uh, I think they will uh, they will be okay with that. They will be uh, easy. Uh, question. So uh, I just want to come back to the technologies of communication for decentralized decision making and there is, there are some technologies out there and I guess this is a question of tools again. I mean even MIT you have Otto Sharma which has developed this theory U which is super interesting also for <coughs> getting groups together and getting them to make decisions or, or you have Art of Hosting which is also really nice or even the more popular design thinking. And there is all this, I mean, all those methods, they come out of, of a ancient technology of like getting together in a community to make decisions. And I guess a complementation between online and offline methodologies is what you are aiming in. So I see a very big tendency in the online te technologies for decision, for like decentralized decision making. But I see also a lack of interest on the offline uh, methods, which makes me question also on the format, why are we sitting facing you, I, why are not sitting in a cycle, for example, which would change totally the dynamic of the, the conversation, you know, is so this is, because well, I, no, 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 just, I'm just saying, you know, there's, the quick answer is that you can't make fits as ma as many people. No, 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 no. It's not a direct critic. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I've already <laughs> had this question by the yeah. troll there. <laughs> okay. Um, just to add a, a little bit of a rebound on the um, decision making and the, and the law aspect of it. Um, so I started coding about two years ago and I was not a programmer and I st I'm still not. Um, but I learned quite a bit about how it works and what's in the air nowadays when it comes to programming. And one of the things that I find is fascinating is that if you look at the developer community, they have found solutions to these problems. And um, some of it is technological, some of it is you know, all this consensus building, the way that the developers are able to build standards over GitHub, um, just contributing and mailing lists and whatever, and it's a long process. And it's really, really hard, but it works. And um, I think it's really interesting to look at how things work in the world of technology and to think about how you can then implement these solutions outside of the world of technology. Because a lot of these solutions can be just taken as they are and looked at with different eyes. And I mean, there's been stories about like GitHub for writers and stuff like that. But that's just the basics. Um, I think there's a lot to do uh, in that space. Okay, a quick point. So, so, so just, just a little quick point consensus. W3C works by massive global distributed consensus between many companies that otherwise hate each other. So when we're, we're building like a new API on HTML5, like I work on the crypto API, 
we have to get consensus between Microsoft and Google. Or, you know, for the social web stuff, it looks like we're going to have to build consensus between IBM and Mozilla. But, I mean, and, and during these sort of movements like Occupy, people said, well, how can we possibly run the world on a giant global consensus? I was like, well, you know, that's kind of the internet kind of already is governed like that through what's called a multi open multi-stakeholder processes. They're tricky. They can also lead the oligarchies and have problems and fall apart like any other political process. But actually what we've discovered over the last, uh, I don't know, let's say 30 or even a bit longer uh, years in, internet, in the internet is that actually uh, you know, global, somewhat democratic, let's say consensus and open decision making does work. And then to, to finish on this point, I think there is also uh, something really interesting to look at uh, on a theory for instance. Um, essentially because you can, in fact, rely on like social and consensus and whatever, but because we are in a social setting, then you cannot really avoid like people trying to, you know, have a bigger voice or influential or like trying to get power and whatever. And so what, we, what is interesting is to try and look at how the technology can actually try and support a consensus and a, like a flat uh, decision making. And if you look at Ethereum, basically it allows you to encode a uh, governance <coughs> mechanism. So you can basically agree to, so you, first you agree to the protocol, you agree to the system of governance. And then the idea is that instead of having this uh, power scheme in which you have people uh, making decisions and like the decision making is like kind of top down or representative in, or whatever you want to see it, but it's like in some kind of like um, architecture where the person at the top will eventually decide. Now you can try and enforce it to be like consensus based, but it's always an effort like you, the whole system needs to agree and then you need to kind of like fight the power struggles and whatever. Uh, in Ethereum, what you can do is you can encode all the procedure that is going to happen. And so the decision making is no longer at the top and then delegated, but it's actually at the, um, at the edge of the, um, of the network. So the, the, the Ethereum application will dictate how people can vote, like what are the rules and whatever. And then the, the processes is transparent. So you know exactly because the, the application is open state, so you can see how it is made. And by, by, by pushing the decision making at the border, then people, all they can do is actually abide to the protocol. Okay? Now the, the, the decision then is like the social element is how do we design the protocol, how do we make it like an actual uh, good and sensible system. But once the system has been established, and then you can also add rules, how you can change the rule of the system with a majority or whatever. But so the idea is we don't want to... Uh, or we, since we don't want to, you could also implement a centralized and hierarchical system, but you can also design a system that is completely flat and that the, the technology will actually enforce the design of this uh, um, government system. So that uh, even if people want, they cannot really like modify the thing unless there is a consensus for it. So uh, the, the last thing that is uh, not decentralized then is the design. Yes. Okay. The last question from... Uh, Three. Can you come to the mic? The first two is the, the mic. Side advantage, sorry. It may be a quick one, so maybe someone come up. It's, it's a good one. But as I li listen to all of this, I'm coming to think, yes, decentralization of ideas, of decisions is good. But I think we need to separate what is the technical problem and the social problem. Decentralize is a social thing. There are a number of technical platforms that provide exactly what we're talking about. The, the real problem I see is that if we try to have a decentralized system, technical system, it's very difficult to then have a decentralized social system because you need people to come to the same place to be able to organize that decentralized decision. So that seems to be the real problem. How can you have separate systems to make a decentralized decision together? Can I just make a comment on that? Is that the basis? Take, take the mic, please. Sorry. Mike. Yeah. The, the basis for uh, all of our technology at the moment on the web is an underlying distributed system, yeah. and so, um, and I think one thing that's really interesting is that that is kind of there's a disjoint and a mismatch between because I was going to ask something slightly similar, but in terms of the commercial organizations here and all not really understanding the efficiencies and the benefits of a distributed system because 
what the internet gives us is this incredible way of all coming to the same place. We're all speaking the same language. And that, that is essentially the same thing. Yeah. Where we get massive ineff inefficiencies in our society is when we have hundreds and thousands of companies all competing for the same space and not at the same trades, you know, that they, they, they are all offering their users trades, offers and requests, and those things are not shared and they're not transportable and they're not, um, you can't trade across vendors. And I think what, it's not really a question, but what I'd like to see is much more um, discussion about efficiencies of systems, efficiencies of societies, because we, you know, we need to talk about that in terms of ecology now and, and you know, sustainability and to, to drive efficiency up into... It's the open source movement. It, 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 it's, op it's open source partially, but it's also about standards, protocols, about, about um, allowing different uh, non... Uh, about users in different vendors being able to um, transact and fulfill different different, um, so it's de various different subtle levels, but it is about being able to transact across vendors. Sure, thank you. Uh, we oh, are already yeah. pretty late, but if uh, you don't have a, a, a last word, uh, yeah. sorry, yeah, maybe a last word, and then I guess that as the, the discussion can go forever, we really meet at the uh, We Shall Labs, uh, We Shall Village 10 Labs can think. <laughs> so. um, I think the core question of decentralizing or re-decentralizing the, the, the web or the social web is um, what's the value proposition? You know, if you look at why Facebook and Twitter happened, it's because they were free. And it was at a time when no one was wanting to pay on the internet. And so that just opened the door to all this innovation. I mean, we can say that Facebook is, you know, stealing our data and stuff, and that's actually very true. But they've also come up with a lot of innovation and a lot of good stuff that we can use. And so, what's the value proposition for decentralizing the social web? Um, and there's a couple of answers, and one of them, in fact, is this notion of, um, you know, this transaction-based decentralized movement, where by providing your disk space and your computer to the social network, to the decentralized network, you get money. Suddenly there's this incentive um, that you can use. So that's definitely one of them. And then the other one, uh, which is more related to, to the linked data aspect, is you, when you get your information back, you can extract value from it and know yourself better, um, and so on. And I think that's really what the challenge is. It's very difficult for people to understand what the value proposition is, and until that comes clear, um, it's quite difficult. So, uh, we at the W3C would like for you, if you have value propositions, to join our global forum at the Social Interest Group. And if you're a technical person, to talk about joining the working group. So just grab me afterwards. And we're also working with the European Commission to help fund small projects. So talk to me afterwards about that as well. We wish you all luck and hope it decentralizes much better by next year. Okay. One last word about uh, how uh, we could make uh, decentralization uh, more mainstream quicker. It's uh, when we, uh, we take the example of social networks, uh, too much time we say, uh, oh, but you, you, if you build your decentralized or distributed social network, you won't be able to bring everyone in it. That's true. That's why we should focus less on bringing everyone in a, in a, quick, a very quick time. But we could build very small social networks, like in a family. Uh, I already use uh, distributed social networks with my mother and my brother. And once all these very small uh, social networks will be built, we could connect them and then make, make a match. Thank you. So that's over. I want to thank our sponsor, the NSA, for bringing so much interest in this subject. <laughs> and let's all meet up there. Yeah.